Well, good evening, and God bless you. Welcome to Bible Study Live. Thank you for tuning in, logging in, coming in the building. We appreciate you. We uh, thank you also for liking, commenting, and sharing, and keeping the conversation going and uh, being a part of the Bible Study crew. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We praise you, we magnify you, we lift you up, we honor you. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word with your people, God. We ask that you would illuminate the study. God, give us something that we didn't even see on Sunday morning. Give us more, something that we can dig into that will uh, develop us into the disciples that you are calling us to be and the people you are calling us to be. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, because of the beginning of March, we had uh, been kind of making up some focus on March being Women's Month. And so I've been talking uh, about some of those things and decided to go to the scripture uh, for that. So there's only two books in the Bible that have titles of women. It's the book of Esther and the book of Ruth. And so I decided I wanted to dive in to the book of Esther. And it it wasn't necessarily pre-planned, it's just as I begin to think, we were coming out of Black History Month and then we came into uh, a month of March and uh, it was International Women's Day. And I was uh, thinking about it and I was like, I don't really know enough about that. And I just kind of started studying it, uh, just, cur you know, not to preach it, but just for my own curiosity. And as I studied it, and I was like, yeah, we have a lot of women in our ministry and, you know, I think we do a good job at trying to make them not less than, but of a part of what we do. And so then I decided, I think I can teach on it. And so that's how it came about. And then uh, we started on, on the first week. We started with this uh, title, I Got a Good Man. And we went to uh, Esther for that. And we just studied the King Xerxes and Queen Vashti relationship. And uh, an, another thing on sometimes in February because of Valentine's Day, I like to talk about relationships, but I didn't get I didn't get a chance to. Uh, God, it took me another way. And so then when March rolled around and I began to look at this whole women's thing and, and was looking at the book of Esther, I thought, wow, this is a good place to begin to talk about relationships because the relationships are very important to the kingdom of God. It's not a secondary subject because the scripture talks about uh, the marriage uh, between Christ and his bride. So the, the analogy of marriage and relationship uh, is important because it, uh, it shows us a lot about love. And so whenever I get a chance to talk about relationships, whether it's marital relationships, dating relationship, as it relates to scripture, it's usually a good thing because there's a lot of people, uh, single as well as married in the congregation who could uh, benefit from those type of talks. So that's one of the reasons why we're there. And so we, we kind of discussed that relationship. And then we just took it from observations from Esther chapter one. And so for uh, Sunday, we had this uh, topic or titled The Favorite. And we, I wanted to continue what I was doing going in Esther. And so I decided to give us a definition of favorite, which is preferred before all others of the same kind, how something or someone gets elevated to the top, stands out above the crowd, gets picked out, uh, the importance of favor in our life, being the favorite, having God's uh, hand on you in a certain way. And if you've ever been around someone who carries the favor of God, you can just tell there's just something different about them. They move different. A lot of times they don't necessarily see it, know it, or notice it, maybe right off. Uh, sometimes you may see it before they do, especially if they're younger than you. And that's why it's good for us to be disciple makers where we can actually mentor people and, and bring them to their full potential. Because some people don't really even know what they have. There are a lot of people who are gifted. The hand of God is on their life and, and they just don't see it, don't know it. Uh, gifted people, uh, what's interesting about gifted people and everyone, uh, for, uh, for example, is that you can see everybody in a room except for you unless there's a mirror. So people see you a lot of times before you see yourself. 
And so when people begin to tell you that you're gifted, there's something special about you, that, that you carry something, you, you need to pay attention to that because a lot of times they are picking up on things that you can't see. And when the favor of God is resting on your life, what happens is you begin to be elevated. You begin to be promoted. Things begin to happen. Doors begin to open for you. And because of that, sometimes the enemy tries to derail you. So understanding the favor of God, understanding that you are favored and you can be the favorite in a situation. You can be, and we'll go back to the definition, you can be preferred before all others of the same kind. You can be picked out of a crowd. You could be elevated and you do not have to apologize for the favor on your life. It could be 10 uh, single women. You could be the first to get married out of the 10. You don't have to feel bad, apologize for it. You don't have to succumb to the hatred that may come your way. When God has chosen you, it's, it's not your fault. You just roll with it. And, but learning it, studying it, paying attention to it can help you uh, get, gain wisdom on how it happens and how we see it in other people's lives. And so we see it here in the book of Esther. So we're going to dig into it. And so what we did is just uh, last time we were just taking observations from chapter one. And this time we're taking observations from chapter two. Now, I'm going to share this again. I've said it before only to our Bible study uh, crowd. I'll share it again because I think it's something that is uh, interesting for you guys to know. When I'm taking a chapter and just only going with that chapter, that is called expository preaching. That is where you are taking one story, one theme, and everything you get is coming directly from that. You're not going anywhere else. And so I enjoy expository uh, preaching a lot. Then there's topical preaching. Topical preaching is when you have a topic, but then you grab several other scripture verses to corroborate what you're saying. And so oftentimes I'm teaching topical where we're going through several different scriptures. But topical is a lot more difficult because you can take things out of context. A lot of times you don't have time to do the whole chapter. So you have to take bits and pieces. And so that requires a lot of work because you could accidentally take things out of context. And so a lot of times when I do that, I try to give you guys a little background from you know, like I'm picking it up in the middle of the chapter because you just don't have the time. But expository preaching is a little different. Everything is right there in the text. And so these last two uh, sermons that we've covered have been expository in the sense that it's only in one chapter, one story. We're not deviating going and grabbing other scriptures. We're staying right in one chapter. And so chapter one, we did it and we're doing it again in chapter two. So just for you to know, uh, for your own information, that's expository preaching. Uh, topical preaching, uh, be careful of that because a person can not be very good at it and they could just be taking things out of context. You really need to do some extra study to know of a person who preaches topically if they are doing it justice. So that's just something I threw in, a side note. Let's dig in. Let's start with chapter 2, verse 1. So it says, but after Xerxes, anger had subsided, and we talked about his anger on the previous sermon, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. And so this is not in the actual chapter. This is something that sometimes you have to look and, and study and get the background. So as I did that, one of the things that we realized is that from chapter one to chapter two is a period of about four years. And so what the scripture says, it says, but after. So a lot of times when we're reading because it's right next to each other, we think immediately after. But a lot of times there is space and there is a verse that tells us uh, later in chapter two why it's that, uh, that far. But it doesn't tell us the details. So I had to do some study. And one of the details we find out is that there was a, uh, a desire from Xerxes to expand the kingdom. And he wanted to go and he wanted to conquer Greece and he tried to conquer Greece and ultimately he failed. He couldn't expand 
to Greece. And if you know anything about the Mede and Persian dynasty, eventually it was conquered by Greece. The opposite happened. They begin to take over Alexander the Great and then begin to take over. So, but before that happened, Xerxes was trying to take over the known world, so to speak. Didn't work, had a defeat. And he comes home defeated. And in his defeat, and his anger has subsided from what had previously happened, he begins to think about what he lost. He begins to think about the uh, person, the queen that he had, and the shifting of loss and not being able to uh, regain what you thought you had or what you didn't realize you had. And so we gave us a few points from, from that and here was the first one, how you feel when you're angry and how you feel once anger is gone can be completely different, specifically in relationship anger. There can be an anger that can cause the relationship to deteriorate, but sometimes after the anger has subsided, after you've gone on in life, you realize it wasn't that bad, wasn't that big a deal for you to uh, blow up over, but the problem is what you felt while you were in the heat of anger and what you have felt now that the anger is gone is different. And now, unfortunately, the decision has already been made, which leads us to the second point, which is this. You can't always take back decisions made from anger. You don't always get a chance to get that back. So that's something you have to understand. You have to understand the power of anger, number one. You have to understand how anger works with you personally. You need to know, are you a person given to anger, prone to anger? Does anger get the best of you? And if you know that and know that it's possible weakness, then you need to know that how you feel when anger is hot and heavy on you is not the same as when it subsides. And so you have to be careful making decisions that are long term based on anger because you can't always get those, you can't always get those decisions back. There's something we've seen in the story of Xerxes and Vashti and he uh, in his partying and his drunkenness, he got upset, talked to his boys, his boys is about like basically saying, give her the ax, get rid of her. But later on, when he was in a place where he needed some comfort, the one that he could uh, count on was not there and there was no uh, body to blame for her not being there but himself and his anger, but the anger was gone now. And so the anger can cause you to do things and then it leaves and you're left picking up the pieces. So you have to be very cognizant and careful of the emotion of anger. The, the, the Bible talks about uh, anger extensively. And so if I was topical preaching, I would go and go to all the different verses that talk about anger, but that's something you can look up on yourself. But it's a, a very real thing and it can cause real trouble, not just in relationships, all over there. People sitting in jail cells now where anger got the best of them. And if they could have had 24 hours to think about it, if they could have had 48 hours, their life would be totally different. But anger is a very volatile thing that can push you in places that you don't want to go. And then that leads me to my final point uh, from that verse is sometimes you don't know what you got till it's gone. Just let that sink in. And that's specifically as it relates to relationships. You don't always know what you have till it's gone. And sometimes you don't know what you had until you've already run it off and you can't get it back. The bridge is now burned. You have to be careful burning bridges because sometimes you have to cross those bridges again. But when you set fire to every bridge, sometimes when you need to go back over that bridge, it's not there and it's no one's fault that it's not there but yours. So sometimes you do not know what you got till it's gone. It reminds me of the song. Uh, it says you don't know what you got till it's gone. You paid paradise to put up a parking lot. Didn't realize that you were paving over something that you were going to need, something that was vital and important, but you allow things to get the best of you. So we see that this is going on with Xerxes, especially after this military defeat. 
uh, in studying him. It talked about him being very ego driven, very hot tempered. A lot of a lot of uh, kings in those days were wired that way. It, it was a uh, dictatorship. There's a lot of uh, you know, we've grown up in a democracy, but a lot of people grow up in dictatorships. And so dictators, they function a certain way, but they're still human. So a lot of times after the anger is gone, after the temper is gone, after the ego is gone, and they're with themselves, sometimes they realize, oh, it wasn't that bad. I could have used this person. There are times where they were, people are like off with their head. Well, now after you've cut their head off, you realize, oh, I could have used them. I needed them. So we have to be careful in our life not to have a dictator approach to life. We, we need to realize that you need people. You need people to do life. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God. You need advice. You need counsel. So you have to be careful running people out of your life just because you got angry because sometimes you don't know what you got till it's gone. So having said all that, let's move to the next verse. Verse 2 says this, though. So his personal attendant suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. This is interesting to me because however he was acting, functioning, maybe he was moping around, it became obvious to the people around him that he, he was off a little bit. He was off his game. He wasn't the same person. So I don't know if he was sulking. I don't know if he was depressed, but it was picked up by the people around him. So they begin to put a plan into place. And one of the reasons for that is because when you function with a dictator, that their ups and downs affects the entire kingdom. So sometimes they had to think about things to do because, listen, his, he's going to make life miserable for us if we don't come up with a solution. So they're scrambling to find a solution. And here is part of the solution, verse uh, 3. I mean, actually going down to verse four. After that, the young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. So let's go, let's find some young women. Now, um, as I, one of the things that I picked up in a commentary, because he was the king, he had what they call a harem. So it's not that he didn't have sex for four years. He did, but he couldn't find what he was looking for. He wasn't finding companionship. And so that reminds you that sex does not always equate to companionship. And so he couldn't fulfill what was missing because Vashti was gone. The queen was gone. And all the things that she provided for him was no longer there. And so they were saying, listen, we're going to have to get you back on the dating scene, so to speak. We're going to have to get somebody back who can be your companion. Because a lot of times when you're building major things, remember last week we talked about his kingdom stretched from 127 provinces that went from India to Ethiopia. So he handled a lot. But sometimes you need somebody who can handle that, who can shoulder the load and he had already ran that person off. And so it was affecting the entire, uh, the entire kingdom. Possibly the defeat that they had with Greece could have been uh, changed had he had counsel from his woman, was able to talk. So, so everybody's kind of suffering because of this. And so uh, a companion is something that they thought is going to help. And so they came up with a plan. Let's get uh, virgins and let's get somebody to replace Vashti. In other words, you need a companion. And so when you look at that, and we understand that it was his fault to begin with, but now it's a four-year process, then that led us, led us to this point here, which is four. Sometimes you just have to move on. Basically, this is what they were telling the king, is sometimes you have to move on. It's true, you need to learn the lesson that caused you to blow it, that caused you to run your companion off, but you can't cry over spilled milk forever. Sometimes you just got to get up and move on. You can't worry so much about the, the divorce, the two divorces. You got to figure out how am I going to move forward? Do I need a companion to uh, be the best version of myself? Some people are, are okay single. Other people, I need a companion. Okay, well, you're going to have to move on. You're going to have to date again. You can't cry about Johnny and Jill. You, you got to move on. You got to do the work. Maybe get in therapy, get in counseling, 
You can't cry over baby daddy, baby mama. You have to move on. And a lot of people get stuck, and they get stuck year after year after year, and they miss the point that at some point you got to move forward. So, yes, it's true. It happened. Maybe it was your fault it happened. Maybe it was their fault it happened. You rehashed it. You thought it over. You grab what you need to grab. You've learned what you need to learn, but now you got to move on. And that is so true in all of life. How many times are we getting stuck in areas that uh, are meant to be moved on? I talk about a lot. There are pit stops and then there are rest stops. Pit stops in a race are designed for you to get fixed and then get back on the road because ultimately you're trying to get to the finish line. Rest stops are just designed for you to sit and rest. And a lot of times people are resting at what should be pit stops. You should be getting what you need, getting re-fixed, uh, recalibrated, and you need to be getting back in the race. But a lot of people are on the sidelines and they're stuck. But once again, I'll say it once again, sometimes you just have to move on. Let the church say amen. All right. 2-5-A, the A, and whenever you see A, that means I didn't take the entire verse. And whenever I do that, I put dot, dot, dot down at the bottom. It means that there's more to it. I just didn't feel it was necessary for my preaching moment. So 2-5-A uh, means the first part or the first half of the verse. So the first half of the verse is this. At that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai. What's important about this is that this story does not set, take place in Israel from the Jewish lens to begin with because this is a story that comes after the exile. So when you begin to read the prophets in the Bible, a lot of them are warning that there's coming a time where Israel is going to lose their land and they're gonna be captured and carried away. Uh, it was prophesied often and it ended up happening both in the northern kingdom and in the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom was carried away by the Assyrians. Southern kingdom was carried away by the Babylonians. After the Babylonians or Babylon came the Medo-Persian Empire. So when we pick up the story in Esther, it is after the first half of the exile has already taken place and uh, the Medes and the Persians have taken over. They've run Nebuchadnezzar away and now they are ruling. But there is no land called Israel like it used to be. And so that means, and we see the same thing with, with Af African, you hear a word called diaspora, the African diaspora, which means many of the African people who were spread ab uh, about throughout all the countries, they have clear African descent, but the diaspora means that they were spread about well, there was such thing as the Jewish diaspora. It's the same thing. After they were exiled, they were no longer in their land. They began to be in all different places. One of the places they were, were was in this land, this uh, Medo-Persian land that was now ruled by Xerxes. And so this still, what's interesting about the book of Esther, you never hear the word God. You never hear Jehovah. It was from written from a different perspective, but you still see the work of God in the land. And so there was a man, and so we'll, we'll go back to it, because it's not necessarily important for this lesson, but it's important for you to understand the entire book. It says, at that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa, which was the capital, whose name was Mordecai. So he was one of those exiled people, but he was making the best of a bad situation. Verse 7, this man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah. Hadassah was our Hebrew name, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. And so he came into her life. Uh, but that story was more common for a lot of people because they were exiles. They were in a foreign land, and so they weren't, everything was not working for them. Uh, they were there because of the punishment, because of a lot of the, the things that they had done wrong, and so they were making the best of a bad situation, but those people who held closely to God, they yet begin to rise, and so we see a Mordecai 
who was a prominent person in this land, but he was Jewish, but he had made the best of a bad situation. But there was trouble. And so the, one of the troubles was this young girl he was raising, she had parents that died. Doesn't tell us how they died, but knowing the way conquerors, conquerors work and the way exile work, they could have been slaves. It could have happened in battle. All kinds of things could have happened. And it probably was not the easiest thing for Mordecai to see his brother and wife lose their life and be leaving behind a young child. But he decided that he was not going to allow that to stop him. So this child, Hadassah, who was uh, her Hebrew name, which meant myrtle. Uh, myrtle is a type of a uh, tree, so it means a plant that grows. But in, uh, in the Persian land, or, or even in the Greek context, that name Esther meant star. And so the point was, even though some bad things have happened, Mordecai saw a star. In other words, he's looking at negativity and decided that we don't have to stay in the land of negativity. There can be something beyond that, which takes us back to what we just, uh, the point we just made, point four, sometimes you just got to move on. This was not a good situation, but just because it's not a good situation doesn't mean that we can't salvage something. We can't still raise stars. We, as Deliverance Temple, we've come through a season of a lot of loss, a lot of death, losing loved ones near and dear to our heart. But what are we going to do? Are we just going to sulk and sink? Or are we going to realize that there still is a, a anointing of God on our life? There's still a calling on our life. Can we still raise stars? Can we still look at the myrtles, the people that are growing? Because one thing that's interesting about a myrtle, it has to be fertilized for it to grow. So because of loss, are we going to quit fertilizing? Or are we going to still realize, hey, there's stars here, and we're going to need the favor of God, and we're going to have to do what we can. So it's obvious that we are the type of people that are going to move forward. So that leads us to another point. Point number five, the father anointing doesn't need blood to step up and step in. And so the father anointing and even the mother anointing learns how to pick up pieces, broken pieces, mold them, mend them, mentor them, and realize, hey, we don't have to stop. We don't have to quit. We don't have to allow what we've been through to be the final chapter of our story. We understand our story is still being written and so we're going to pick up the pieces and move on. Sometimes it's too late for you personally. So what you do, you invest that time into somebody else. You father someone, you mentor someone, you mother someone, you disciple someone, you become the Mordecai for someone's Esther. You say, hey, hey, I'm gonna step up to the plate and step in and I'm going to do what I can to help this person become into the star that I see in their potential. And so that's what he did. As we begin to move on, we see this in verse eight, as a result of the king's decree, the decree to move on, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. All right, and so it was something that we think about here is that we've got this young girl who is from Jewish descent. The Jewish laws and culture, very different from the culture that they're in now, but they're trying to make the most of a bad situation. And so Mordecai is in charge of this girl, but for somehow he sees this opportunity that is arising. And the next thing we know, care is being transferred from Mordecai to this Haggai person. So that makes me see this point. Point six, wise mentors recognize an opportunity no matter how it comes. If you recognize, and remember the study we did last week, we realized that Xerxes is not the best human being in the world. He does have an anger problem. He has a drinking problem. And so are we sure that this star that you're raising, Mordecai, turning Hadassah into Esther, are you sure putting her into the king's harem is the best 
possible thing may or may not be, but Mordecai took a chance. One of the things we see in between chapter one and chapter two is that Xerxes is uh, four years later, but he seemed to be having a change of heart. He seemed to be realizing, hey, I made some mistakes. So he could be in a better position than he was before. The only thing that we know for sure is that this opportunity was not passed up by Mordecai. He realized not only is she a star, but she is beautiful. She's good looking. She is the cat's meow, so to speak. In other words, there's something on her, and I don't want to be so protective of her that I don't allow uh, an opportunity to pass by her. And sometimes when people are in your life and they're trying to disciple you, mentor you, mother you, father you, sometimes they're so protective that they are afraid to let you take chances. But it didn't seem to be the case with Mordecai. He was willing to let her take chances a chance and this chance set up the entire rest of the book, the entire rest of the book, which gets into the Jewish context if you study the whole book. But there it was something important, but a chance had to be taken. And he had to basically sign off on it because from what we understand is that she listened to him. She submitted to him. She would have not done it had he not said yes. So there was probably a conversation, but whenever the conversation came out, both of them decided this is a chance you need to take. And the next thing you know, she was in the care of Haggai and, all, and ultimately auditioning for the king to be the next queen. All right, let's look at verse nine. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatment. He also assigned her seven maids specially chosen from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Uh, one thing that is not mentioned here that I learned from commentary and study is that there were is at least 400 women that were in this auditioning to be the next queen, 400 young women. And so they didn't, weren't picking ugly women. So these were beautiful women. So that means out of the 400, out of the other 399, they were all under Haggai's care. In other words, before you even get to the king, I'm gathering these women and seeing who would be good. I don't know if there were more than 400 and Haggai turned them away. He's like, look, you can't, you, you're not going to make it. And it, it was narrowed down to these 400. But the one thing we do know is that Esther stood out above the crowd. It'd be easy to blend in with the other 399 and it'd be hard to stand out. But there was something special about her, probably because of the mentorship that Mordecai had done, because of what he had spent time with her on. The fact that she was an orphan, she, she could have quit, her life could have been over. He steps in and he was not going to let her fall through the cracks. He began to really uh, mold her and shape her. And I mentioned it on Sunday in uh, the English Standard Version, it says she had a beautiful figure. So she was built well, she looked well. Mordecai did not do what other men have done throughout history. Even when there is a relationship, take advantage of. He was, an uncle, he was a cousin, but he stepped in and he uh, was careful of her as a father, not uh, thinking about her body and, and taking advantage of that. He was really careful and so then by the time she shows up and Haggai sees her, Haggai sees, look, there's something special about her. In other words, the favor of God is on her. She's not like everyone else. She's different. And because of that, he began to do things to put her at an advantage. And by doing so, the other people were being disadvantaged. He began to assign people like, nah, in other words, I see something on her. But... I want to go back to the first part of that verse uh, that we read. 
verse 9, it says, he was very impressed with Esther, which I find fascinating because Esther was not trying to marry Haggai. Actually, Haggai was a eunuch. What they did with eunuchs when they captured them, they demasculated them. In other words, they took off their genitalia. So when you see a eunuch, they were not able to even perform sexual functions. They were, uh, they were really the property of the kingdom. But that didn't mean anything to Esther. She still impressed him. What Esther understood is that just as I submit to Mordecai, my cousin who stepped into my life, then if he puts me in this opportunity and I'm in the care of Haggai, I'm going to submit to Haggai. So she must have had a demeanor that was, that just really caught his attention, that impressed him. I don't know what she did, what she said, how she did it, but it made a major impact. And so that led me to this point that I thought was very important. And here it is. Wisdom realizes there are levels to favor. In other words, she understands ultimately she needs to impress the king. But the king is not the first person she meets. She's going to meet Haggai first. And so she learned that I need to be able to win favor on every level. So, and I gave the example of a person maybe having a dream that they're going to meet the CEO of Apple. And so they're going to talk to the CEO, but you're not going to get on Apple property and get directly to the CEO. You have to talk to a security guard. You have to talk to a secretary. You may have to talk to an assistant, a vice assistant, a vice president before you get to the top. And what a lot of people don't understand is they feel like you need to step on everybody till you get to the top. But wisdom knows, no, you need to win favor on every level. You need to realize that there's nobody unimportant. So the waiter is just as important as the chef. The valet person is important. And when you function like that, and you, especially when you have been raised right, you understand how to procure favor on every level. And people who know how to do that, what, what they don't often know is a lot of times they're speaking directly to the person who can open the door to get them where they need to be. So being kind to everyone, being considerate to everyone, being willing to impress everyone. It's very hard to make a second impression override your first impression. So if the first impression that someone has of you is that you're a jerk, a lot of times it's hard to get promoted. So you got to learn how to, on every level, learn how to treat people, treat people with dignity and respect. And a lot of times what is happening, you are actually procuring and winning favor at every step of the way. The scripture says of Jesus, it says that he grew in favor with God and man. Now he was 100% God and 100% man. Being Jesus that he was, he did not need man. But the scripture says two things about him. It says he learned obedience through the things he suffered. He's the king of kings. He don't need to obey anything. But the Bible lets us know that he humbled himself and he obeyed. He obeyed his mother. At 12 in the, uh, in the temple, he was teaching the other rabbis. And his mother was like, look, we left you. We lost you. Come back. He submitted to her. He first told her, I should be about my father's business, but he submitted to her. And from the age of 12 till 30, we don't hear from him again teaching. So for 18 years, he submitted. But then the scripture says he grew in favor with God and man. Jesus, being the greatest, didn't have to gain favor, but he did. He humbled himself. So that means that as he was a carpenter, the people that he helped he gained favor on every level. Actually, people who were, quote unquote, beneath him, he gained favor. Same thing with uh, Esther. If she was to become the queen, Haggai was, is going to become her servant. He's going to be uh, beholden to her. She'll be able to bark orders to him, but that didn't mean anything to her. She still was willing to impress. And so there are a lot of Christian people who are so caught up in their mind that I'm going to heaven. I don't need nobody but Jesus. But you miss opportunities to be kind to people, 
to win favor, and that can take you very, very far. Promotion often is not a snap of the finger. It is steps. There's levels to promotion. Verse 10, Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. So in his raising of her, one of the things that he told her is that your real identity, your ethnicity, we are not going to share. It. We're not going to talk about it. He probably told her all the reasons why. He probably told her the reasons of the exile. It could have had something to do with the way her parents were killed. But for whatever reason, she was instructed not to do so. And so that leads me to point number uh, eight. And here it is. Wisdom knows when to shut up. When you are winning favor, one of the things that you learn is observation is better than communication at times. Sometimes it's better to sit back to and observe and learn than to do a bunch of talking. Sometimes moving in silence is the best thing you can do to walk in the favor that you need to walk in. Sometimes the things that you know, you don't need to share it. Sometimes things about your path don't need to be shared right away. Things about your parents, things about your education. Sometimes wisdom is just to shut up, be quiet, learn, be, uh, be observed and not heard. You know, because a lot of times you can stand out in a crowd because you're moving different than other people. You're functioning different than other people. You're not always, look at me, look at me, look at me, 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 me. You're not always the first to rush on Facebook. When you put something on Facebook or social media, you're very strategic about what you do. You have a plan. You understand that that's your brand. You understand you're branding yourself. So if you don't want to be branded as a whore, then don't act like one on Facebook. If you don't want to be branded like a pimp, don't act like one on Facebook. Be quiet. Be thoughtful. Watch how other people crash and burn. Make moves that are smart and strategic. Wisdom. See, favor is important, but wisdom is important. It does you no good to have favor and you don't have the wisdom to go with it. And so sometimes wisdom is just to be quiet. Learn. Shut up. Don't tell everybody what you're doing, what you're working on what you're planning on doing. Sometimes post the pictures after you're already back. You don't always have to show everyone what you're doing all the time. Sometimes you can, but there needs to be a purpose about it. You need to be strategic. And so what Mordecai understood is that this could be life changing for my cousin, who I'm raising as a daughter, but it could be life changing for me. It could be life changing for our people so we are going to be strategic. We are going to be smart. We're going to be wise. We're not going to run off at the mouth. We're not going to be, I'm not telling everybody that my daughter, my goddaughter, it could possibly be the queen. Listen, we're going to pray. We're going to uh, move. We're going to be quiet. We're going to think. All those things are important. And the older you get and the wiser you get, you understand that. Sometimes when you're young, you're young and dumb. And sometimes you confide in the wrong people. You talk to the wrong people. You share with the wrong people. Sometimes when relationships are uh, struggling, sometimes you share with the wrong person. Next thing you know, the person has left you and got with the person you shared with because you gave them all your secrets and they came behind you and stole your man, stole your woman. Sometimes it's just good to be quiet. Sometimes it's good to go to God about your problems and not go to everybody else. Not everybody's qualified to handle your problems. Not everybody's qualified to handle everything you know, everything you learn. Some things you learn later in life, DNA tests. You take a DNA test, it te tells you things you never knew. You don't always need to go and blab that. Sometimes you just need to be quiet, learn, and figure out what your next steps are. You can't always figure your next steps if you're always running talking, running off at the mouth. Sometimes you have to be still, be silent, be quiet. Verse 11, every day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. 
I love the way Mordecai was moving. He didn't just throw her to the wolves. This is an opportunity. And he, uh, yes, allowed her to be an opportunity, but he cared. He cared about what was going. And the scripture says every day. In other words, every day he was checking. But I like the way he was doing it. He wasn't uh, forcing his way in. He was just staying close enough to know what he needed to know. In other words, if this goes south, let me get my goddaughter out of there. Um, we, we can't do this. Or this is good. Let her let her keep going. Or maybe he was praying over her as he got to the courtyard. We don't know what he was doing, but what we can see it was he was invested in her success. He was invested in her future. And so that brought me to this point that I thought was good. Point nine, wise mentors know how to gain information without interfering. So he knew how to get close, get the information that he needed without crossing the line. And I made this statement that sometimes, especially mothers, mothers really care about their children, but sometimes they interfere. Sometimes they cross the line. If your child needs a coach, let them have a coach. If you're not trained in coaching, stop trying to tell the coach how to coach. Sometimes you need to go to practice, observe, pick up, but you can't be everything in every season. And sometimes all you do is embarrass your child because you interfere. Learn how to gain the information. Learn how to be close. I'm not saying be blind. The other uh, spectrum or to the other side is the pendulum swinging all the way to the other side is parents who just let their kids do anything and don't pay attention. You have kids building bombs in the house, in the room that you pay for, and you know nothing about it. That's ignorance too. Learn the balance of being very involved without interfering without crossing the line, especially when you're dealing with adult children. Me as a pastor and as a leader, I am not your father. I'm a father figure. I'm a leader. So I can't interfere. I can suggest, I can offer information. I can try to be there if you need me, but I can't force my way. I could, but it's unwise. It's unwise for me to show up in the middle of your date and say, hey, y'all doing too much touching. No, I should be able to give you the wisdom and you carry it out. And if you fall, I should be there to pick up the pieces and help you. You have to learn how to be close enough to the situation without interfering. And the problem with interfering is oftentimes, especially when you're trying to mentor or disciple people, father them, mother them, oftentimes you don't leave room for the Holy Spirit. You cannot be mentor and Holy Spirit. You train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, it will not depart, meaning the training will not depart. You cannot hold their hand and control everything. And a lot of people, they love people so much that they get into manipulation and control. And that is a really bad habit. You got to learn how to back off and back up. Be close enough so you know what's going on, so you can pray, you can be there if they fall, you can support, but you can't do God's job for him. And sometimes, especially when you have grown children, sometimes you need to let them fall. Stop fixing everything. Stop jumping in because they don't learn the lesson they need to learn. As long as you will always bail them out, they'll never need God. And they will always be in situations where they're always going to fall on their face until you get out of the way and let God work with them. So be like Mordecai. Know how to get close enough, but be far enough away. You're not interfering. You're not crossing lines, but you're not neglecting your responsibility to father, mother, mentor, disciple people. Sometimes people ask me questions and I know the answer for me, but I won't tell them the answer. Because they need to figure it out on their own. If I do it for them, they'll never learn what they need to learn. So I give them the pros and cons to both. Okay, this is what I'm thinking about, Pastor. What should I do? I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to tell you these are the pros, these are the cons. But you need to make up your decision. Because if I'm making the decision for you, how are you ever growing? If Mordecai does not let Haggai do what he needs to do, how can she be prepared the way she needs to be prepared? So he was close, but he never interfered. That is very, very wise. 
All right, moving on. Verse 12. Before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, which is absolutely amazing when you think about it. 12 months, a whole year. Six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments, which leads me to this point, point number 10. Wisdom knows that impatience interrupts promotion. Some things just cannot be rushed. Some things just cannot be hurried along. This was a process of them being beautified, and it was a 12-month process. We don't know before they got to that point how long it was before then. We know that once they get to this point, it's a whole nother year. So that means they cannot be in a rush. They cannot be in a hurry. But this promotion could change their life forever. It could change them uh, from being on the bottom to on the top forever. Remember, Xerxes is over 127 provinces. Up until this point, all we know is Esther or Hadassah is just a orphan girl who happens to have her cousin has to step in to help her out. But her life is about to change forever. So you can't rush it. Many times people miss their blessings because they are too much of a hurry. Here's the thing. If you've been broke 364 days, what's one more day? Don't do nothing stupid now. Trust the process. You're going to be okay. And so, uh, but what I also like about this, and so I'll, I'll, I'll go back for a second. It talks about six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. Some of the things that you're forced to wait in actually benefit you. Sometimes the no that you hear or the wait that you hear may not be what you want to hear, but it actually benefits you in the long run. So yes, she has to go through these beauty treatments, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Sometimes when you're forced to wait, it helps you with stress. It helps you with calmness. Well, pastor, I really, really want someone to be my companion. But there's a whole lot of stress that comes with a wedding. There's a whole lot of stress that comes with marriage, a whole lot of stress that comes with building a family. Sometimes you being by yourself and alone, while that may be uncomfortable, might be the best thing for you. It might be better than what you know. You can think for yourself. You can go when you want to go, how you want to go. You can put on what you want to put on. It may actually benefit you to wait. It may actually benefit you not to be, not to do. Well, pastor, listen, I got to get to L.A. to do blah, blah, and blah, blah. But when you get to L.A., it's going to be a little harder than what you think. So you being stuck in Muncie right now may not be the worst thing if you can reframe it in your mind and realize, hey, I can make the best of this situation. I can go to church while the pastor and them are going to love on me, care for me. They're going to speak into my life. Then when I get to L.A., I'll be ready for whatever I got to face. And there's a lot of people, once they got to where they were going, they were so grateful for the little places they were before they got there. I'm so grateful for mama and daddy. I'm so grateful for my home church. I'm so grateful for the times that God told me no or told me to wait. So, so you can't be in a hurry, but when you're not in a hurry, sometimes you begin to enjoy the journey. I say this all the time. One of my biggest mistakes is I was so pressed for the next thing, such a vis visionary, I forgot to smell the flowers and the roses on the way. And one thing that you do not get back is time. And so when you miss moments and things trying to chase after the next best thing, the next big thing, the next move of God, then sometimes you look back and like, man, I wish I would have enjoyed that season because that season's gone. When you're dealing with young children, and especially fathers, you're trying to make a living for the family. You're not going to get the two years, three years, four years, five years old. You're not going to get that back. When they're 16, 17, 18, you're going to miss them being in diapers. You're going to miss them being in your lap and slobbering on you. So enjoy it while you have it. Don't be in such a hurry. What God has for you is for you. 
and it's going to come to you and you're going to get it and you're going to walk in it. So don't rush it. Take your time. Because once again, wisdom knows that impatience interrupts promotion. All right, we're, we're about at the end. Uh, I'm going to go over just a little bit. Verse 15, when the turn came for Esther to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the, woman, of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Won't give, because of time, I won't give you any extra. Just say it. Here it is. Wisdom knows that greed gets in the way of favor. Let's look at the last three verses. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet in the seventh year of his reign, verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the women. He picked her out of all the other 399. She was the one. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Final verse. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. If you remember last week, Vashti didn't even get a feast, but this is a different Xerxes now. And out of all the people, Esther won the favor. She became the queen. The royal crown was put on her head. And so you, the questions you asked, especially as we looked at last week, why didn't it work for Vashti? She didn't seem to be a bad person. Seemed The problem seemed to be with Xerxes, not her. But here's something that you need to remember when it relates to favor. Here's point 12 and the final point. Favor knows what didn't happen for someone else has nothing to do with what happens for you. I don't know why it didn't work for Vashti, but that's not Esther's concern. This was her season. This is her time. Favor had found her. And it may not have worked for another church. It may not have worked in an, uh, another time, but this is our season. This is our moment, and we're not going to shy away from it. We're going to brace it, and we're going to realize it's okay for us to be the favorite. It's okay for us to expect the favor of God to hit our life, hit our homes, and for us to walk in it and be what we need to be when it comes. Having said that, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the favor of God. We accept it. We believe it. We walk in it. We want to have the wisdom it takes to procure it, to, uh, to sense it, and grab hold of it. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great, wonderful, marvelous week. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you. And we will see you again on Sunday for Palm Sunday. And for those of you who are coming in the sanctuary, we're going to have a special dinner at the end of service, a fellowship dinner. So God bless you. See you soon.